Welcome back to another depressing episode of What Happened, the show where we dissect and discuss things like Anthem. Yes, it should come as no surprise, but EA and Bioware's latest title is also the latest in a string of big budget AAA games that have had rocky development cycles, rockier launches, and the rockiest of post launches. However, the dark clouds for Bioware and Electronic Arts didn't just start and end with Anthem. No, that, that was a storm front that rolled in pretty much precisely when both entities first met. To tell the story of Anthem, we have to start where all the trouble began, and that's the moment Bioware signed on the dotted line and became part of the EA family. But wait, you're owned by one of the biggest, most profitable video game publishers in the world! A job security, tons of money and resources, there's, there's no downside here. Just ask this programmer. Uh. He'll tell you that being part of the EA family is great. Still don't believe me? Well, let's ask these other plucky and thriving developers. Jokes aside, the number of studios that have been purchased and then shut down by the publishing titan is indeed long and illustrious, and unless things change really soon, Bioware as a whole might be next on the list. But how is this possible though? How could the minds behind Baldur's Gate, Mass Effect, Dragon Age, and Knights of the Old Republic be at risk? Well, when you have a project that's been in development for the better part of a decade, was intended to have a persistent online life of 10 years, and coupled with some murky sales numbers. Well, things start to get very what happened -y. So let's all hop into our time cop cars and try to see how we got here. In the year of our Lord, 1995, which gave us such milestone events as Pierce Brosnan's turn as 007, Diddy's Conquest monkeying about on the SNES, and the release of the greatest video guide of all time, Bioware was founded in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada by like 10 or 12 doctors who quickly made a name for themselves with two releases on the PC, the Mexim Shattered Steel and the incredibly influential RPG Baldur's Gate. Thus followed was a string of even more hits, which Bioware produced under different publishing partners, and included such standouts as MDK2, Neverwinter Nights, Star Wars KOTOR, and Jade Empire. It was around this time that the bells of looming fate began ringing, and Electronic Arts came calling, since they seemed to have a bit of a fetish for buying top pedigree developers that cut their teeth on the PC market. Bioware fans, of course, were overjoyed. Oh no! <laughs> Very quickly, things started to happen a little too quickly. The purchase of Bioware was made public in 2007, and over the subsequent two years, a lot of key staff just quit the company. Trent Oster, one of the six original founders, formed Beam Dog in 2009 and was joined by Brent Knowles, one of the senior designers on several of their older RPGs. These two big departures happened during the time of Mass Effect 2, and that was a series which of course was a commercial and critical darling at the time. It didn't go unnoticed by fans, however. The sci-fi franchise was still a bit of a departure from the high fantasy the company was known for, especially when it came to the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay. Regardless, the idea of an entire trilogy that would take into account players' choices was awfully ambitious and exciting. Speaking of which, it was also around this time that perhaps the ambition and corporate structure of EA started be rubbing off on the Canadian developer a bit too much. The company started multiplying seemingly overnight. Bioware Montreal. Bioware Austin, Bioware San Francisco, Bioware Sacramento, Bioware Mythic, and Bioware Victory were all either built from the ground up or companies renamed to better fit Bioware Mania. All of these subsidiaries were formed in just a few short years. For right now though, let's fast forward to the release of Mass Effect 3 in 2012, a beloved sequel that capped off the epic trilogy with class and absolutely no controversy whatsoever. Featuring things RPG fans love, lumb down dialogue trees, and narrative choices that change the colors. I'm not five shapes and colors the likes of which I've never seen. This was not exactly the conclusion fans had waited for, and it was ill time because Dragon Age 2, released a year earlier, had already experienced similar fan backlash. 
This one-two punch of disappointing sequels was the first sign that Bioware was maybe stretching themselves too thin, because their stories certainly were. Behind the scenes, however, things were just as tumultuous within the company itself. Just a few months after the release of Commander Shepard's glorious send-off, two more old guards of the developer, Greg Zezchuk and Ray Musaika, announced they were quitting the studio they had founded. The exponential explosion of growth for Bioware, paired with both Doctor's promotions to vice presidents within EA, might have been maybe too much pressure or not enough creative control in the games they were making. Whatever it was, they both announced their retirements from the game industry in September of 2012. It was also around this time, according to current Bioware producers, that an idea began gestating within the company. An idea they had no clue what to do with for years. Initially, the project was codenamed Dylan because, uh... It'll... It'll be the Bob Dylan of video games. <laughs> One that would be referenced for years to come which is an actual quote from 2014, often attributed to one Casey Hudson, one of the senior writers at Bioware that had penned the Mass Effect trilogy. Casey would then quit the company that same year. Jesus. It's pretty clear by now that Bioware employees weren't enjoying their jobs for various reasons, and the dubbing down of a lot of their games and the style in which they made them was safe to assume pressure from EA or Bioware's new MO, which was to make their games more accessible and mainstream stop that. Work continued on Bob Dylan for three more years in absolute silence until E3 2017, where at EA's conference, Anthem was shown to the world. While it was certainly nice to see a brand new IP from the developer, reception was a bit mixed. There were clear similarities anyone could see between another loot-based cooperative shooter, Destiny, which released two years prior. Whatever Dylan was originally going to be, it's obvious that more than a fair share of design choices were inspired by Bungie's IP. It's an online-only sci-fi world that had you shooting monsters for loot, and there seemed to be only shreds of an RPG left in the game. Bioware, however, told fans not to worry, but producer Ben Irving worried them further with the following statement. You think back to Bioware's history, it's kind of famous for creating these really immersive worlds and amazing single-player stories, relatable characters, but there was always a sense of wanting to do multiplayer. <laughs> Even looking way back at With Neverwinter Nights, that had a multiplayer mode, and the Mass Effect franchise has a multiplayer mode, and Star Wars Old Republic is this huge online world. While story has been important, there was this real desire to create this shared world experience, to have an immersive and amazing story that you could share with your friends, both the story itself and the experiences that you have while out in that world. So that means no more romance options, no dialogue wheels, Anthem was pretty much abandoning anything Bioware had done up to that point. Point. But hey, change can be a good thing. Those javelin designs look cool, and man, the flying's pretty smooth looking. Okay, you know, let, let's just see how this goes. Bioware boss Aaron Flynn quits the company shortly after Anthem's debut. Unbelievable. You're right. So, yeah, following the E3 reveal, and don't forget the disastrous launch of Mass Effect Andromeda, the general manager of Bioware Edmonton left, only to be replaced by Casey Hudson again. What, what is going on? Uh, so apparently, Aaron wanted out, and Casey wanted back in, so the timing worked to their advantage, I guess? Casey had spent the better part of three years at Microsoft farting around with holograms and decided he wanted to finish up Anthem in the end, the game he had abandoned. Now, this is not our first rodeo here at What Happened. You guys have seen enough to know that hirings and firings like this... And they spell disaster for you as sacrifice! Regardless, with the newly reappointed Casey Hudson, EA announced that Anthem would see release in 2018, and they maintained they would support the game with various events and DLC for a good long while, and were confident it would enjoy a 10-year life. No, it won't. You know what game also enjoyed a 10-year life? Not Destiny. It seems that the announced sequels to your games that aren't even out yet strategy from a generation ago slowly morphed into the announce your games will have a 10 year lifelong strategy, with both of them being really stupid. I know, should make this a challenge, huh? 
Now it's time for a new segment, Let's Left Bioware. Well, July 2017 saw Mike Laidlaw, creative director for all three Dragon Ages, saying adios, followed by one Drew Karpashai, the lead writer on KOTOR, Jade Empire, and Mass Effect 1 and 2 in March of 2018. Now, speaking of 2018, EA announced that Anthem would not make a 2018 date and would instead ship the year after. While this seems really not very good at all, EA Damage Control was, you know, quick to act. Regardless of how it's being portrayed, we're not looking at this as a delay. We've chosen not to launch Anthem in the fourth quarter. The state is chosen by portfolio balance, not product readiness, and we're really excited by the way the new Battlefield <laughs> is shaping up, so it probably doesn't make too much sense to launch Anthem right by it. As a new IP, we should give Anthem its own launch window. And you know what, gross EA man, that does make sense, and hell, such a delay, plus the five years the game has already spent in development, will make for an easy, issue-free launch, I'm sure. So let's sum up. Casey Hudson is now leading the fractured development of a game he hadn't seen for three years. It needed to be always online, have seamless co-op, tons of weapon and loot balancing, and needed a public demo, er, a VIP demo, ready for early 2019 to boot. Just like another big budget AAA release, this demo also had no shortage of the troubles. If you pre-ordered Anthem, you would get access to this VIP demo, which would run for three days. Well, I mean, some people got access to it, while others didn't. There were three main problems with this thing. The sheer amount of players trying to access it caused issues that Bioware head of live services, Chad Robertson assured, were not due to underprepared servers, but couldn't state what did cause these issues. Oh, oh, okay. Second, were that some specific accounts were being auto-blocked because of the way the game was flagging things, and then the infinite loading issue. The latter would prove to be the toughest nut to crack, and Bioware admitted there was a chance they wouldn't be able to fix it before the three-day period was over. Anthem was scheduled to fully launch in less than a month. They said they could handle it, and the price was right. Then there was the chart. This baffling graphic detailing when and how people could play the game was okayed by a metric shitload of marketing people and everyone must have thought it was a good idea. I mean, it's a good move to try and explain things to your audience if shit is getting complicated, but when your release chart looks like a periodic table of the goddamn elements, maybe you kind of overcomplicated things from the start. Finally, there was the game itself. You and a squad of friends chose your class and kill monsters to get loot, and then you use said loot and weapons to kill more monsters for more loot. Rinse and repeat. While there certainly is a story in Anthem, it was clear to any longtime fan of the company this was a far cry from the RPGs they were known for, and in fact, this couldn't be any farer cry from it. So enthusiasm wasn't exactly at an all-time high leading into the February 22nd launch of the game, and things didn't get much better post-launch. The PS4 version would crash PS4s, online stability was tenuous at best, and that infinite loading bug from the demo, well, it was fixed. Just now it was the near infinite loading bug. It's not exactly clear why the game is such a technical mess. Maybe because Bioware bit off way more than they can chew with the game's online structure. Maybe it was the constantly revolving door of game directors. Or maybe it was because so many senior designers and programmers kept oozing out of the company's back door. Or more likely, it was all of those things. Now, while hindsight is 2020 and you want to sell your game during interviews, let's check back with Chad Robert and once more with a quote shortly before the launch, cause, you know, it's hilarious. We always want more time. The beautiful thing with Anthem though, is the fact that we're a live services game. Time is infinite. We're always bringing more content, new missions, new stories into the fold later on. So one of those challenges for us was how much content do we actually ship on disc at launch? Do we have the time to do all the things that we want to do? Because quality is always king, right? One thing with Anthem is quality over quantity. Absolutely. Do we have enough quantity? We believe so. But the quality is definitely what we shine on. <laughs> 
Oh man, that didn't age well. Now, far be it from me to tell a company how to run itself, but if your product is in a state where you have to issue patch after patch to try to salvage the product, now is probably a bad time to target the players of your game for perceived slights. Only two weeks into Anthem's launch, and people began reporting their accounts were being banned for simply playing the game as intended. I'm sure most people are aware that the employees that ban players are hacking a game are not exactly the same ones who fix bugs, but it still comes off as very tone deaf and a pretty bad look for their PR department in general, especially when your PR department is probably on fire right now. Well, the, the real humans won't, uh, won't, won't burn quite so fast in there. Bye. And at the end of the day, yes, players that use exploits and hacks or are toxic to others should be addressed, but maybe you should tackle that when your game isn't in tatters. Just a thought. Like previously stated, both Bioware and EA are in damage control mode right now. Every other day there is a patch to fix some things, but it winds up just breaking something else entirely. Also, since launch, players loudly complained about the quality and quantity of the drops the game was providing, but this seemingly fell on deaf ears for weeks. Then, on March 15th, Bioware relented and increased the quality and frequency of the loot players were receiving. Now, this is either an actual intended fix or a calculated move to satiate disgruntled players. Worse than that, however, there seems to be an underlying issue that even the chunkiest of patches will never solve, that this is not exactly the game ardent fans of the developer wanted. At its core, it's an online loot-based shooter in a sea of online loot-based shooters with simple window dressing masquerading as actual characters or a meaningful story. Now, it's admirable to want to make a product outside of your comfort zone, but it's pretty clear that the prolonged, unfocused, and fractured development dotted with a lot of talent leaving throughout the years hurt Anthem from day zero. While it's an exciting goal for your game to be referenced for years to come, in this case, it won't be for anything positive. More so than that, Bioware itself is a cautionary tale of a company reaching beyond their scope and expanding far, far too quickly. Of the aforementioned Bioware subsidiary, all but one has been shut down or just renamed, with that being Bioware Austin. Now, while some may say that a developer of their pedigree could never be closed down due to its past successes, the same was said of Pandemic or Visceral and a whole host of others. So with all this, it should not surprise that Anthem is now the lowest rated game Bioware has ever released, narrowly edging out its competitors Sonic and the Dark Brotherhood. This would also be the time to address the commercial prospects of Anthem, because while exact numbers are not public, it was the number one selling game last month. A month filled with holdovers from January and not much else in the way of competition aside from maybe Metro Exodus or Far Cry New Dawn. EA told investors they expect Anthem to sell 6 million units in 37 days, so it has until the very end of March to achieve this. But right now it's a bit murky if they are on track for such a number, because as of right now, all EA has said is that Anthem is Bioware's second most lucrative launch outside of Mass Effect 3, but again, the units sold both physically and digitally are not yet known. And now that most players have finish the main campaign, the immediate concern is the end game, as there isn't much reason for people to continue with it, at least when stacked up against similar shooters. Now, in terms of fixing that and the future of the franchise, let's get one final quote from the man himself, Casey Hudson. We were, of course, very disappointed about the launch, as were many of you. I've been in there playing with you since those early days, and it makes me sad to hear about any issues that would hold someone back from fully enjoying the game. I take that very personally, and it's been our top priority to get improvements out to you in the fastest, safest way. The safest? What is he talking about? We continue to listen to your feedback, with more improvements to endgame loot and progression, game flow and stability, and performance coming very soon, so there's a lot of work we intend to do, but we understand there is skepticism out there. No. We hear the criticisms and doubts, but we'll keep going anyway, working hard every day on Anthem, an ever-changing world, constantly improving and growing, and supported well into the future by our team of passionate developers. Godspeed, buddy. Godspeed. So while this tale might not have a definitive end yet, you never know when it might get one. 
But in the meantime, let me know in the comments if you're aware of any other baffling video game blockbusters that failed to bust any of the blocks, or head on over to the Flophouse VIP Lounge where you can officially vote on upcoming What Happened topics. See you next time, and thanks for watching.